Marcy Jastro is SVP of Immersive Entertainment, Immersive Media, I'm sorry, at Technicolor. Um, so I want to kind of pick up right there because um, <laughs> Technicolor has been around for a minute. And Technicolor really defined in many ways what the film industry was. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about, first to kind of set the scene. What is Technicolor doing in the immersive space? What's, what's, uh, what's happening? Well, um, I, I need to back up a couple of years, I think. Take it. Um, so Technicolor was the company, is the company that created the three-strip process for color. Based off of that, um, they created the ecosystem around distribution of film prints into theaters. Um, that was something that was done for about 90 years. Um, so they were deeply rooted in all different aspects of entertainment and media. About eight years ago, nine years ago, when I started Technicolor, um, when I started with Technicolor, I was working for a company called Laser Pacific. I had been in the post-production and visual effects industry for 20 plus years, um, working on all different types of films, um, from film to digital, Back to film, to digital, um, looking at different workflows. Why did, uh, techni why did I end up at Technicolor? Well, I built a company, I was involved in a company that was looking at near set daily systems. So once the lab went away and you weren't shooting film anymore, you had to process your dailies in a different way for people, studios, creatives to look at it. Um, they bought our company, I came over to Technicolor and realized at the same day that I started, I was brought into an office and told that they were shutting down every lab globally across the world. And that the system that they bought from the company that I was working for is that system that is going to scale globally for Technicolor. Um, so no pressure. <laughs> um, but that started a reactive chain of where we actually were, not only in the entertainment and media world, of, it was of the world itself. We were moving away from hard workflows of, of you know, shooting film, getting it de developed, and then getting your prints back. It was now about instantaneously being able to view everything that you wanted to view. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's entertainment media, it's happening right now on, on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Everybody wants to be able to do that. So in looking at that, Technicolor decided to become a fully digital company where we scanned um, both in advertising, marketing, visual effects, and then post-production content, as well as some production of content. Um, at the time, I was head of sales, and I always wanted to work on the hard films, you know, or the hard episodic television shows. So films like, uh, you know, Jungle Book really intrigued me. How do you build a completely digital 3D world large enough to be able to see it um, in a feature film, you know, in a theater? And then, um, you know, how do you start looking at 360 and how do you use these tools to build content? Um, I worked on Avatar. Avatar, a lot of people think, you know, one of the first questions people ask me of why immersive is it going to be like 3D and just die. Um, and I said, well, you know, Avatar wasn't just about 3D. Avatar was about the shift in every movie theater in the world and moving from projection of prints to actual digital media through DCP. So where does Technicolor live? It's a really interesting space, right? So we help to build content, we help to create content, we help to ideate on content, we help to monetize content, we help to distribute content, um, and we care deeply about the stories that are made and how those stories are distributed and, and received by the consumer. We're not a consumer-facing company, um, although we care deeply about what the consumer sees. Great, thank you for that thorough answer. Um, with that being the case, I know we've talked in the past about you get kind of frustrated when people get too impatient with the progression of, mm -hmm. of this medium. Um, and, and you've referenced examples in the past of how different media have matured and what those cycles looked like. So could you draw some parallels for us to kind of help ground us in why we're actually moving 
at a normal, if not rapid pace. Yeah, I kind of think we're moving fast. Um, I know that in the last five years, I've made probably about 20 different pieces of content in XR, um, which that's a lot of content, especially in, a, in an area in which there's a non, there wasn't a repeatable, scalable pipeline in place of game developers and animators who were building this content. Uh, that's what we did in the lab that I run, where we said, look, we have 8,000 artists across um, the world. What would it look like to put these traditional artists who've been making in, you know, feature films and television shows, and then pull in different artists and have them work together? So um, I think that that trajectory of, of where we're at, I was thinking about it, because I knew you were going to ask me that question. I was thinking about, in 1983, my father brought home a brick phone. And that phone was one of the first phones that was ever given to an executive. And I remember I couldn't dial out and I couldn't do anything with it. But then the car, you know, the phones went into the car. Or then I think about the black and white TV and how long it actually um, took for there to be mass adoption. So that rate was 15 years. So my friend Stephanie Lamos, who runs um, research and analytics at Superdata started using the parallel of, you know, black and white TV versus color. And she said that essentially that adoption rate was 15 years. Um, so I said, well, do I get to say that we're five years into it? Because I feel like I've been in it for five years. So now we only have 10 more years left for adoption. Well, I think it's going to be a little faster. I think we're looking more like 25, 26. But it's not about the adoption. It's about everything before it, right? Because you need to have a steady flow of content, a distribution channel. So for me, I think that a parallel for the, for the television is a good one, the mobile phone is a good one. Because if you think about it, in the 90s, you were still on a Blackberry, or you were on you know, the first smartphone, or you still had your pagers. Um, I, I, I think that we, we live in a world where we want everything now but the consumers aren't buying now because it doesn't make sense for them to buy because it's too complicated for them to use. And I think back to some of the work that was coming out in, you know, as far back as 2013, but 2014 and 2015, particularly when Hollywood got interested, mm -hmm. where now we look back and we're like, oh, that was so cute of us, you know? Like we didn't know, there was so much we didn't know and I'm glad that it's taken a little bit of time to the point now we're at this inflection point where we have a bunch of new hardware coming out that might actually be poised for mainstream. Yeah. So what are some things that we've, like from your vantage point, because you've both uh, produced content and you've also engaged with tons of content across the board from different creators. What are some things, some valuable lessons we've learned in this past, like let's say five to seven years that will be really important looking into kind of the next wave of content for things like Quest and Magic Leap. Yeah, so the first thing I learned is that every time a piece of hardware comes out, don't get so excited, because <laughs> it's probably not gonna do anything. I mean, although Quest is having a really nice run right now, um, one piece of content coming, or one piece of content and one piece of hardware coming out is not actually gonna change the world. Um, it's the ecosystem that surrounds it uh, that will change the world and the positive uses of whatever it is you're building. Um, I learned that, and I think Hollywood learned too, which is really great because, you know, why we need people in Hollywood to adopt it is because they have a lot of money. And so we need those people and companies that have money to want to invest in something. Um, so I think that we've learned that we need to change the behavior of the way in which people are building films and television today by using some of the new tools and technology that's coming out. So as I referenced on the last panel, um, getting people like a John Favreau or Rob Legato to be wearing goggles or Caleb Deschanel to be wearing goggles when they're building content on a stage, um, that then, again, grows the ecosystem because then they bring their friends in and their friends and their friends and then they start building content differently, which then now they now can take advantage because it's a long tail. You know, from the time you get funding to produce a TV show or, or film, it could be 18 months. And then in that 18 months, a lot of different things can happen. So um, it's changing behavior of how 
what they've done and how they've done it for the last 15 years, how are they going to add these tools into it? Um, and I also think that what will change it is um, successes. So, you know, we need to fail. And the reason why we need to fail is we need to learn. And I think it's okay to fail every single day. I do it constantly. Um, but then I can come up here and tell you of all those stories of failure, right? Um, we did probably some of the most interesting content, uh, content with entertainment companies that didn't do so well. And at the same time, it didn't do well is because you didn't really know what you were building. You didn't know what was gonna truly engage using VR and then IP. Um, but now what I look at is I look at that I have all of that learning and all those teachings that I can now get that feedback loop. And so when I make content now, or when I think about making content, I think about what, what do we want to do? So think about in terms of how to train a dragon. This is a really interesting case study. How to train a dragon wanted, and wanted to work with Walmart to figure out if they could create an emotional connection between high-end IP and, and active merchandise sales for that same piece of IP through Walmart. So they created something called How to Train a Dragon in a Positron chair, which is a 360 chair. Um, you don't, we don't have any here, right? Um, that um, ultimately gives you directed view of what you want the viewer to see. In addition, it's got haptics. Um, the idea was that they are going to take this chair on the road and move it around to 30 different Walmarts and ultimately see if they can get these people ages 8 to 80 into these headsets who have never experienced this content and see if they could change the behavior around their purchasing of a merchandise. And they did. Ultimately, people's first time ever in VR, ultimately first time people ever got to have that experience, people who are 83 years old wanting to do it. Um, so to me, those little baby steps of excitement around that and getting being able to get that feedback that, to me, is what will grow the industry. Was that a really long way to answer your question? No, it's nice. It was great. <laughs> um, but kind of picking up with something you kind of said within it, you talked about you know, growing the ecosystem and having these kind of learnings as you go. I know that your, your selection process for the artists that you worked with at Technicolor for the pieces that you produced was very specific, and it was geared around community building, and it was geared, geared around learning things. Yeah. So could you speak to those points? Because I think the people here would be particularly interested. So when we were first deciding to build this lab, the Technicolor Experience Center, um, it was really about the ecosystem within Technicolor. Um, we had all these different silos, right? So we had research and innovators, 250 of them sitting in Wren. We had The Mill, which is one of the largest advertising and marketing companies in the world um, working on content. We have MPC, who's doing big films like Jungle Book. Um, uh, visual effects films, and then we have Technicolor proper. Well, you know, across that group of people, uh, we needed to figure out a way to, in a safe environment, build content because nobody really had the ideas that you needed to bring developers that create in game engine as well as the animators. We also have 2,000 animators and developers in India. So I had to figure out a place to kind of put all these people together and to feel safe. But in, in an insulated way. So, you know, Technicolor is more of a post-production company, but we wanted to build our own content, so I needed to build a stage, and I needed to do all these things. Well, what was happening as I was building this thing, I realized that we needed to also be a safe place for the community to come in and to ask questions. Because just because you created a game and just because you've created an app does not necessarily mean you know how to make a piece of... VR, AR, MR content. So we started really community outreach and really started to, to get to know people and what they wanted to do. And I also was supposed to be looking at verticals in which we could potentially move Technicolor into um, using VR, AR, and MR as the tip of the spear. How do we all of a sudden get into architecture? How do we all of a sudden get into um, medical? How do we get into our, um gosh, location-based theme parks. And so using all of these different types of ideas, I had to come up with content to be able, as POCs, to, to show that. 
So, and I also like working on hard stuff. So um, I wanted to, one of the first pieces of content we worked on was a piece of 360 content. I need to feel really comfortable in the workflow of that content, so that was my brother's keeper. Why I liked that was it was PBS, and, and I thought that it was interesting to talk about the Civil War and the manner in which these storytellers talked about the Civil War. It became the number one downloadable piece of 360 content ever, which is interesting um, because it's, you know, it's a good piece, but it's about the Civil War. Then I started thinking about education. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Like, what a great way to be able to teach kids today that we could teach them a moment in time through VR, make them feel more connected and emotional. So we, we started that road and we created an artist in residency program where we had many different artists. We had installation artist Lynette Walworth, which is the piece of content that's here. And it's a Wavna, which is the story of the first female shaman in the Amazonian forest. Um, talking about ayahuasca and um, ultimately how it changed the socioeconomic impact of that tribe. Um, what was beautiful about it is that all of a sudden, not only were you creating a piece of content that was for social impact, you were creating a whole bunch of an array of things because you had AR in it, you had interactive point cloud in it, you had the ability to walk through the forest, the idea of what it feels like to be on ayahuasca without really taking it, so you should all check it out. Um, it's really good. But it was never about us building, you know, being the, the storyteller. It was about being able to take Lynette's view of what that story was and using all of these new technologies, how could you bring it to life? Which then you get to talk about because ultimately not anybody else has done it. Um, live music festivals. I mean, I think we're not taking advantage enough of those large pieces of, of, of places in which people congregate. Um, so we built a piece of content for a guy named Jonathan Zwarda, who is Flume's creative director. And, you know, I wanted to understand, like, how do we build content that scales assets across the way? So that was a fun one that we did with Jonathan. And um, that went to South By, and it was really interesting, but it ended up being meditative content. So it wasn't just about the content being about a large film, a music festival, it was about using that same content for meditation. So, um, and then the other one we did was Building Mars in 2117, and what that would look like if it was inhabited um, for a million people. And my whole question, and, and the whole thing was, why would you wanna go to Mars? You ultimately have everything you want here, let's just make this place better. Um, so, you know, the con but that was more about the architecture market and how do you take large scale assets and create beautiful assets in a game engine and show people that you could do that for architecture. Very cool. Well, we're getting close on time, so I want to, I wanna, again, some of this was covered in, in the last panel, but different people are going to different places. Um, who are the types of uh, creators, thinkers, et cetera, that you're looking to be in touch with with your work at Technicolor and how do people get in touch with you? Um, so, uh, easy, marcy.jastro at technicolor.com, um, or LinkedIn is also um, a great way to get a hold of me. I answer every email, by the way, so I do do that, because I'm always looking for the next person. Um, for me, it's really about a product at this point. It's not just about making content. Um, what are we going to do with that piece of content that you're creating, um, and how do we scale it, how do we commercialize it? How do we, how do we uh, grow the ecosystem? How do we you know, make a repeatable, sustainable distribution network? Um, and make, making content for me is not just about telling the story anymore, it's about building the platform in which to tell those stories. Cheers. Well, thank you so much, Marcy. Thank you. <laughs>